Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Celestron StarSense 114 LTAZ scope. It's an astronomical telescope designed for looking up at the night sky. Now you see a lot of different variants on this particular form factor here, but at the heart they're all the same. There is a 114 millimeter mirror in the back that gathers light about four and a half inches, deflects the light into the secondary mirror and into this focuser. This is where you look and this is how you focus. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. It's on what they call an alt azimuth mount, or alt as for short. It's just a fancy name that says that the mount moves up and down and it moves left and right. So again, there are lots of telescopes sold with this particular form factor, but what makes this one unique is the StarSense app here. There's a dock here that holds your phone and you put this in here and your phone becomes a navigation aid. This helps you find things in the sky a perennial problem for beginners. Now this is the third of the StarSense telescopes that I've reviewed from Celestron. The first one was the 10-inch Dobsonian. That one got a big thumbs up. The second was the 130DX. That one I didn't like so much. The mount was too flimsy to hold the telescope steady, and there were lots of other little problems as well. Moving down the food chain, we come to this one. Its price is a little bit hard to determine. It's supposed to retail for around $299 US, but it is routinely discounted to the low 200s. And I've even seen this thing under $200 in some cases. So since I like the 10 inch Dob and the, the 130 I didn't like so much were coming down, you can probably guess where this review is going. And in fact, the owner of this one has since upgraded to the eight inch daub version of the StarSense and he reports that he's very happy with his. And I don't doubt that for one minute. And when he gave this to me, he made it very clear, he's not in any hurry to see this come back. All right, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. What is the StarSense module? Like I said before, it is just a navigation aid. Now I do get some questions from people about this, so let's knock a couple of these down right away. Is the StarSense a go-to telescope? In other words, will this telescope go to objects by itself? And the answer is no, it won't. The StarSense is simply a navigation aid. Second question I get asked, can the phone take pictures through the eyepiece? And the answer is no, that's something else. The StarSense is strictly a navigation aid. The third question I get, do I have to use the StarSense? Do I, you know, maybe I don't have a smartphone, maybe I don't feel like using it, do I have to use the StarSense? And the answer is no, you do not. And in fact, in all three cases of the models that I've reviewed, most of the time I didn't use the StarSense for one reason or another. The StarSense app is very well written. I only use one of these about once a year, and whenever I come back to one of these, I'm always a little concerned I'm gonna be rusty, I should. This, again, is a very well-written app. It walks you right through the process. The first thing you do after you put your phone in the cradle is you use these two knobs back here to center the phone over the mirror. The mirror should see all of the lenses on your phone. It then walks you through a series of procedures in up to and including finding a tree in the background somewhere far away that you can focus on. It turns out that I do have a tree that looks exactly like the one in the app, so I went ahead and used that. What you're then supposed to do is take your finger and drag on the phone so that those red crosshairs match the top of the tree. You are no longer physically moving the phone, you're just dragging the crosshairs to the top of the tree. After that, you should be all set. Now at night, the app has a number of different functions, including a star tour of the night sky, depending on what time of year you happen to be in. And you can go to any number of these showcase objects. For example, I'm gonna show you here going to Jupiter. And what it does is it shows you where it is. And the reason it knows that is because it takes a picture continuously of the night sky through your phone. And just by comparing it to an internal database, it knows where it is in the sky. So if you want to go to Jupiter, for instance, it arrows showing you where to go and you do whatever you have to. As you get closer, it magnifies and eventually you will get on target. It will also talk to you. M45 is the Pleiades star cluster. Called the Seven Sisters, it is a naked eye tight knot of five to eight stars depending on conditions and the watcher's eyesight. Since the Pleiades require no optical aid to observe, it has been known and named from the earliest times. The name Pleiades seems to mean full. 
Okay, so hopefully I've done a good job of explaining the positive attributes of this telescope. Unfortunately, when you begin to use it, things go downhill pretty quickly. Those of you who know telescopes, those of you who have been around astronomy for some time, you have already identified at least two major problems with this model. And the first one, of course, is the mount. It's always the mount. <laughs> on inexpensive telescopes and even on some mid-priced ones, it's always the mount that does you in. It doesn't matter how good the optical tube is, if the mount doesn't hold the optical tube steady, you're not going to see anything. As a very general rule of thumb, every time you see this U-shaped yoke style mount, it's not very good. It may seem okay over here in the daytime, but when you try to use it at night, it does not hold the telescope very steady. And because you're gonna be tracking objects through the sky, it's very difficult to make fine-tuned movements and get it to stay there. You'll also see this bar on the side. This is also a dead giveaway that the mount is no good. What it's supposed to be for is you're supposed to be able to use this to fine tune, in this case, the altitude axis. But in reality, the real reason they put that there is for stability. They know the yoke mount isn't steady enough, so this becomes a stabilizing force. Again, two red flags whenever you look at a mount. The optical tube. Okay, so the optical tube is a 1,000 millimeter focal length. That's about 40 inches. You can see right here the optical tube is nowhere near 40 inches in length. And the reason for that is it's because it's the dreaded Bird-Jones optical design. There's a multiplying lens in the focuser here. This is always a sign of junk. Now I have to repeat this. There is nothing inherently wrong with a Bird-Jones optical design. It has advantages and it has disadvantages like any optical design. The problem is the Bird-Jones optical design has been appropriated by the cheap junk scope market. So when you see it, it's almost always a sign of junk. This relay lens is not of high quality. It may not be collimated or adjusted correctly. And in fact, having that thing in there makes it difficult or impossible to collimate the telescope itself. So you tend to have to stay with whatever alignment the telescope came with out of the factory, very often trying to collimate it conventionally using these screws in the back does not work. So, you know, we had this thing out several nights in a row, and first thing is, I found the star sense was not terribly useful. It, it would tell you to do things, and then you, you do this, and then you let go, and then the telescope would sag, or you try to, you know, track, and it, it's just not working very well. I found I had better luck just sighting through the red dot reflex site and finding things conventionally. Now, let's be honest here. Most people who buy this thing are going to look at the moon, and they may look at Jupiter or Saturn and then declare themselves satisfied. And if they are satisfied, that's a perfectly valid response. As you get further down from those three objects, things start to get a lot more frustrating. I looked at a lot of the winter and spring objects through this telescope, and as time went on, it just got to be very frustrating and inconvenient. As the days went on, it started to feel like work. So, People have asked, well, how good is the optical tube really? I did the star test on this thing and it's weird. It, it, it looks like it's undercorrected. It, the elements are not completely centered. It's sort of off to one side, a little bit of coma. And again, there's nothing you can do about it. How this manifests itself is if you look at the Orion Nebula, for instance, the center of the Orion Nebula at low power is actually pretty good. I could actually resolve the four stars on the trapezium. As you move out from the center of the Orion Nebula, things get fuzzier. And when you see a fuzzy star near the edge, sometimes you'll wonder if that's something and you'll kind of move over there to see what it is. And then it gets sharper because it's near the center and you wind up chasing your tail. Again, could you use this thing if you were patient and determined enough? I guess you could, but again, it just started to feel like work for me. Another question that I get asked, well, let's, why don't we just ditch the mount and use the optical tube by itself? You can. This is the same diameter optical tube that you see used on a lot of 114 millimeter telescopes. So if you have a clamshell, if you have rings, you can do that. I didn't have those, and even if I did, if you notice, there's very little real estate on this tube. A tube ring, I think, is probably going to be out of the question, and rings, I mean, you've got a little bit of a space here and a little bit of a space here. You're gonna have to have a rather long bar, a dovetail bar to put on a mount. You know what? I just lost patience with it. I'm sure it can be done, but I didn't do it. 
you know, we were sitting around talking about this. The 1,000 millimeter focal length is too long. It yields too high a magnification for what the mount and the optical tube are good for. If this were shorter, it would be better. We also had a discussion about this Barlow. This is a real curiosity. It's incredibly cheap. And we raised the question, why is this thing even in there? You are never going to use it. You've already got 1,000 millimeters worth of focal length. Why in the world would you want any more? Why would they go through the trouble of the extra cost of putting this thing in here? And the answer the guys came up with was probably marketing. The beginner who does not know telescopes may be more enticed to buy this thing if they know that there is a device that doubles the magnification and the beginner doesn't know that this actually makes things twice as bad. Someone I know refers to this telescope and ones like it as 10 minute telescopes. In other words, if all you're going to do is go outside and look at the moon for 10 minutes, you could be satisfied. And in fact, that's what happened here. I was out here one night and a car came by, family piled out and said, what are you looking at? And I happened to be looking at the moon. So I showed it to them and they were happy. And they said, well, do you have anything else? And that's when things started to get a little bit less interesting. I pointed it at Jupiter and it was okay. You could see that it was white and round and you could see some dots on the side, but it wasn't very sharp and there was no detail on Jupiter. Luckily, I did have with me the Celestron Omni 150, that's the 6-inch F5 Newtonian, on the SV225 mount on AVX legs. It was much better and much more pleasant to use. Now, this is okay, but, you know, there's other problems besides the things that I talked about. Well, one of them is that the scope is very light. This entire thing weighs less than 11 pounds, and much of it is top-heavy. You are going to run into this in the dark. Watch out, it could tip over. Also, the mount, the more I played with this, the 25 millimeter eyepiece yields 40 power. Even that seems to be a little bit high. Yes, it has trouble holding it at 40 power. I instead switched to a 32 plossel just to get the power down, and at 33 or so magnification, it was all right. I seem to be a magnet for inexpensive telescopes here lately. People drop this stuff off, and then they don't bother to pick it up again. That's the Power Seeker 127, the one in black. That's the thing you really shouldn't be buying. The blue one here is the Astromaster 130. I didn't care for that one either. And we have the StarSense 114 here. Is there a silver lining here? Is there a however? I do have people contacting me who buy these and they are disappointed at them. And a common question I get is, is there anything I can do? Can I upgrade it? Well, when you have problems with both the mount and the optical tube, that gets really hard to overcome. I wanted to like this. I wanted to tell you that it was okay. I wanted to tell you that there were workarounds for the problems, but in the end, there were just too many issues to deal with. Is there a silver lining? Is there a however? Maybe there's two of them. One of them is between the three of these, this is the one, if I had to use one, this is the one I would choose. It's slightly better than the other two. Not sure how much of a compliment that is. The second thing is you do have the StarSense dock and the activation code for the app. That is the same across the entire StarSense line. So what I might suggest if you wind up with one of these, use it up until you've seen everything you can with it. And you can remove that StarSense dock and get something like a mid-sized Dobsonian, move everything over to the new scope, and you're good to go. So you're paying $200 or so for a dock and an activation code for the app. Well, look, just chalk it up to experience. So there you have it, folks, an overview of the Celestron StarSense 114 LTAZ. I hope you found this information interesting and useful. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.